We trust that the message we have today uh, will make it uh, worth your while standing. I talk to you about how to get even with your enemies. Heavenly Father, this is an important word. Lord, I, you, you put this so heavy on my heart, and I ask you to help me now with your unction and anointing that me speak as an oracle of God. I don't come in my own strength or my own mind. I come, Lord, with your mind, the mind of Christ. Lord, I know that you put this in my heart, and your mind is in me, and I speak your mind now by the grace of God. Sanctify me. Purge me. Let me stand here as a clean vessel with clean hands and a pure heart through the sprinkled blood of Christ. And sprinkle our ears that we may hear and our hearts that will not harden. And Lord, teach us from your word today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. How to get even with your enemies. Now, nearly everybody has an enemy, or two, or three, or more. I think it would be very rare to find a Christian who's not been wounded or hurt by somebody. And if you sit here today and you've not been wounded or hurt, your time comes. And those who hurt us the most are those that we have loved the most and those who are closest to us. They are the most capable of wounding and hurting us. Nearly every week somebody comes backstage and talks to one of our staff, to me, or one of the pastors, and it goes something like this, uh, Pastor, there's someone in this church who's lying about me. Somebody in this church is spreading uh, slander and rumors about me. There's someone in this church that doesn't like me. We hear that so often. There's a lady in this church, God bless her, I think she's here this morning. She goes home to a family who won't even talk to her. It, it, they have hurt her so and wounded, and she's serving the Lord with all her heart. But because she's serving the Lord, and some things just given in her heart so completely to the Lord, they won't even speak to her. Others tell me, uh, tell us about the awful abuse they take on the job. Because you see, Christians are often the most uh, abused people on the job because of our stand. Because of your stand, you will be abused, sometimes by the boss, sometimes by your co-worker. You're the focus sometimes of the scuttlebutt in the office or victims of gossip and slander. And there's some of you sitting here right now in this church, and you can think there's names and faces that come to you when I talk about an enemy. They have chosen to make themselves your enemy. Now, how is a Christian supposed to deal with enemies? How are we supposed to react to those who talk about us, who slander us, who bring rumors against us, who try to get us, literally get us, whether it be on the job or families who try to hit on you and they've made themselves your bitter enemies? How do you react to this hurt and this wounding many of you have right now? Is it scriptural to get even? Now, folks, I'm going to shock some of you and tell you that not only is it not wrong to get even, but God demands it of you. Oh. Do I have your attention? In Second Kings chapter 2, don't turn there. There's a story about uh, the old prophet Elisha. And evidently he had a bald spot on his head. He's on his way to Bethel. Remember his... his, his uh, uh, the Elijah, the prophet that he was a servant to, has already been translated in a chariot of fire, and he's on his way to Bethel, and there are 42 young men that follow him. They come out of Bethel, and they start mocking him and said, Go up, Baldy! You know what they're doing? They, they are literally mocking this man because they don't believe the translation of Elijah, and they're saying, Where's your chariot, old man? Hey, Baldy! Be resurrected, be translated, get up, go, disappear. And you know the story, Elijah calls out the judgment of God, and two she-bears come out of the woods and eat them up. I mean, devour them, consume them. Two wild she-bears come and they destroyed them. You say, uh, you know, and this has hurt the sensibilities of a lot of people who don't know the gospel, they don't know the word of God, and they don't know the Lord. He was not trying to defend himself. He was not doing that out of anger. Keep, keep in mind, please, by the way, the original Hebrew says young men, not little children. And, and I'll tell you this, the same word is used 
in, in the scripture when it speaks of Solomon. Solomon at the time is 20 years old, and he says, I'm but a little child. I know how to go out or come in. And Jeremiah, even though he's a prophet, said, I am but a child, and the same word is used. I'm but a young man. I, I don't know. But you see, Bethel had become a very evil place and given over to idolatry. And the word of this prophet being resurrected was too incredulous. And so they, uh, they really ruined the minds of these young men. They had absolutely destroyed their faith in God. And this was judgment not only upon these young men, but on the parents and on Bethel. Keep that in mind. You say, but was it? Uh, uh, that's what I want. God, two sea bears out of the Rocky Mountains. My enemies. Lord, you know what they did to me. They hurt me. They mocked me. And, and, and you know, we're, I'm not talking about little she bear, uh, literal she bears. But there's something in us that wants to get even. There's something in us wants to settle the score. Now, he called in the name of Jehovah. And there, there was judgment upon these. And see, we read these Old Testament truths and we say, Well, God, you defended your prophet Elijah like that. Why don't you defend me? Lord, get my enemies. Get on them. Do something about it. Do I hear someone say, that's exactly what I need? You don't mess with God's people. You don't mess with me. I'm a child of God. What about the quick way God dealt with the enemies of Moses? Remember, there's an entire clique rises up, uh, led by Korah, Dathan, Abiram, and 200 of the princes, supposed to be the most godly spiritual people in the whole camp. And they rise up and they accuse Moses of everything conceivable. They, conceive, they, they accuse him of pride, ambition, and even murder. They went all through the camp slandering this meek man, saying the reason he brought us out here, he has some hidden agenda that we don't know anything about. Remember, he was in Egypt. This man is trying. He's somehow still in league with Pharaoh. This whole thing was a setup. He brought us out here. He's secretly an Egyptian. And he's out here to destroy us. And they slandered this man. They spread rumors everywhere trying to destroy his effectiveness. He said, they said, you take too much authority on yourself. Is exactly the, uh, what happened. You see, is it wrong for a Christian to get angry when you get slandered and, and hit upon so much? Well, what does the scripture say? Moses was very angry and said unto the Lord, Respect not their offering. And you know the story. Fire came out of heaven. First of all, the ground opened up and swallowed Dathan and Abiram and the family of Korah and everything that belonged to them, their children, their belongings, their tents, all disappeared into the earth and the earth closed upon them. Then fire fell from heaven and consumed the 250 rebels that rose up against him. These were his enemies. God did this. God rose up and dealt with their enemies. Now, do I hear somebody say, Lord, if not a she-bear, how about some fire? Maybe just a little fire in their apartment, burn their furniture, save their life, but get the furniture. Lord, how about a, just smashing their car for me? Do you say, oh, I wouldn't think like, oh, ho, 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 ho. That subtle thing that the devil puts in the heart of revenge. Lord, at least fire them from their job. That's enough fire for me. Fire them. Make them pay, Lord. They hurt me. They have wounded me. Lord, you've got to do something. You did it for Moses. I'm on good scriptural ground. Do it for me. In the ninth chapter of Luke, Christ's disciples become enraged because Jesus is passing through Samaria on his way to Jerusalem. And the Samaritans reject him, don't even want him to come into the town. And they mock him, we don't want him. Because you see, Jesus was going to worship up in Jerusalem, and their worship was in Gerizim. And that's the wrong place. He's a Jew. He's going to the wrong place. We don't worship in Jerusalem, we worship in Mount Gerizim. And he's going in the wrong direction. We want nothing to do with this Jew. 
And the the disciples now uh, are, are this is wonderful men of God, James and John, close to the heart of Jesus, and they know exactly what to do because this is racial prejudice. This is nothing but blatant rich, uh, racial prejudice because the Jews and the, and the Gentiles and the Samaritans especially hated one another. And so they don't want this Jew and his entourage passing through somewhere. They don't want him to stop there. They don't want him to eat there. Let him go around town. And this, this riled these two great men of God. Don't they know who he is? This, this man is a holy man. This is the son of the living God. And they remembered what Elijah did when Ahazah sent, King Ahazah set up uh, 50 men to get Elijah down from the mountain because Elijah was prophesying his death because of his immorality and his idolatry. And fire came out of heaven and consumed 50 soldiers. Another group of soldiers, 50 more came, and suddenly fire. Elijah said, if I'm a man of God, let fire come from heaven. And it burned him up. Another 50 soldiers. You remember the third entourage, the third group that came, the man says, I'm not going to get burnt. And he says, oh, sir, please don't call fire down. He repented in front of this man, and he said, I'll go with you, and he went with him. And these disciples are no doubt thinking about that. Lord, they come back and say, these are the most prejudiced people. What do you do when you face racial prejudice? Well, simply, you've got good scriptural premise. You call fire out of heaven. Lord, they said, should we call fire out of heaven and consume them? <laughs> they were ready to stand out there, wave their hands and say, Oh, breath of God, come, burn them all up. You say, that would never think like that. No? Jesus said, wait a minute. He's, he's, he, I know they're, because they refer back to what the prophet Elijah did. And, and they are thinking there's only one way to deal with your enemy. You, you, you call fire out of heaven, the earth opens up and swallows them, God gets them. And how many of us think that? Get him, Lord. You know what he did, you know what she did. Make them pay, make them pay. Things are getting so quiet, all of a sudden, you were laughing a little while ago, now everybody's quiet. When James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? Huh. Jesus said, you know not what manner spirit you are of, for the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And how quick we are to ask God or to think of judgment coming upon those who reject us. There, there are ministers, hot-headed ministers in the land today who are willing to curse anybody that stands up against them, their doctrine or their manifestations or, their, or whatever they're preaching. They're hot-headed and they stand and they throw curses to the left and to the right. There, there's a video right now out that has just shaken so many people because it shows unusual manifestations. And if you saw it and you walked with Jesus, you would know it was stinking flesh. It would just turn your stomach. But at the end, there's a man, there's a preacher who says, if you don't agree with this, you're sitting against the Holy Ghost. Words to that effect. And it's affected so many. Let me tell you something. You do not have, the Holy Ghost does not curse his own children. The children of God. He doesn't curse his people. He doesn't curse. I'm, you need never fear any minister or any Christian who throws or hurls a curse in your direction, no matter what it may be. I've, I've had a young man here Friday night uh, fearing he'd committed the unpardonable sin. And when I, when I heard it, I was shocked that he could believe and that somebody could put that kind of a trip on him. And, and let me give you the scripture. The Bible says... Bless them that persecute you, persecute you. Bless and curse not. Let them curse, but you bless. Psalms 109, 28. And Psalms 10 says that God says only the proud 
person curses. In fact, God calls those who curse people liars. The scripture says the wicked in his pride will persecute and his mouth is full of cursing. The man who curses you is a liar, the scripture said. He's full of pride. And you touched his pride. You've touched his little idol. You touched his little thing that he does, his stick, we call it. You've touched his stick. And you touch his stick, you touch his pocketbook. I'm not railing, I'm not mocking, but folks, you've got to understand what the scripture says. The wicked in his pride persecutes, his mouth is full of cursing. Because he remembered not to show mercy, as, as he loved cursing, so let it come upon him. As he delighted not in blessing, so let it be far from him. As he clothed himself with cursing, like as with a garment, so let it come into his bowels like water and like oil into his bones. The man who curses, the Bible said, it turns around and comes right upon him. You curse anybody, you curse your enemy. You try to curse your enemy, you try to call fire. And when I say call fire, you're talking about, Lord, a sickness, a woe, disease, anything that makes him know that he's wrong and I'm right. You say, Brother Wilson, this not turned out the way I thought it was. He said, you don't know what spirit you are of. That's not the spirit of God. That's not the Holy Spirit. You want to get even with your enemies? First of all, forget the fire. Forget the she bears. Forget the cursing. According to scripture, you can't even rejoice or gloat when your enemy falls or stumbles. You can't even secretly gloat about it. The Bible says, Rejoice not when your enemy falls. Let not your heart be glad when he stumbles, lest the Lord see it, and it displeases him, and he turns away his wrath from him. This is where a lot of people get bitter, friends. They, 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 they see a friend or someone, not a friend, they see somebody who's wounded or hurt them, and something happens in their life, and right away this certain Christian says, Uh-huh, uh-huh. I knew it would happen. You see, you touch me, and you pay. You touch God's anointed, you pay. Lord, you're not finished yet. And, and, you, and, and, and this, this subtle thing, and they go down, and you won't say anything but inside, down inside. And the Bible says, and here's where a lot of people get bitter, because suddenly God takes away his wrath. He takes away all the judgment. He begins to bless them. The blessing that belongs to you goes to them. And then the people, I know people been bitter for years. Lord, how can you bless him? How can you bless her? You know what they did to me. You know why they're being blessed. The Lord lifted his wrath. He lifted his judgment because of your attitude. The Lord says, if, you want to hear it again? Rejoice not when your enemy falls. Now let your heart be glad. See, it's in the heart. Don't let your heart rejoice in that when he stumbles, lest the Lord see it and it displease him and he turn away his wrath from him. Beloved, how careful we need to be when someone who has hurt us comes under woe and calamity. How careful, be very, very careful what you think. Be careful what you say. There should be mercy in your heart. There should be pity. There should be a reaching out to those people and say, I'm so sorry. And you should not want that. You should not desire that upon any enemy. And the Bible said, if you even secretly think about it, God said, that's it. He lifts his hands and begins to bless them. Then you sit there in bitterness trying to figure it all out. You dare not try to get even with your enemies by avenging them yourselves. To avenge means to get satisfaction by inflicting pain or punishment on the injuring party. Or to vindicate yourself by inflicting pain or evil on the wrongdoer. It means to give injury for injury, insult for insult, to settle the score by taking personal vengeance. Try to settle the score. What a dangerous thing to try to take vengeance yourself. Revelation, or Romans 12, 19, Dearly beloved, Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, 
I will repay, saith the Lord. David said, it's, it is God that avenges me. It is God who delivers me from my enemies. Thou liftest me up above those that rise up against me. Thou hast delivered me from the violent man. You know what David's talking about? He's talking about the time that he was hiding out from Saul, and his men went out into the fields and protected the flock of Nabal, that wicked, violent man Nabal, married to Abigail. In the time of shearing and harvest, David's men are hungry. He's, remember, there are at least 600 men hiding in Adullam's cave. And he is, they're hungry. And these men have never once stolen a sheep. They've kept the robbers away and the wolves and the bears. And so David sends a delegation of young men up and he, and he says, the message was, Nabal, we have been faithful. Ask your shepherds. We have watched your flock. Could you, you spare something for us? Our men are hungry. Nabal mocks these men curses them and said, David's nothing but a runaway slave. And they bring this message back to David. David jumps on his horse and, and gets five, 400 men on their horses and said, that's it. Payday. By morning, there'll not be a male left standing in his camp. And David, in his fury and his rage, is going to avenge himself. And somebody with the grace of God, ran to Abigail, told him there are 400 men, and David's leading the flock, and they are burning up. They are in a rage. <clears throat> Abigail loads her donkeys, probably 10 donkeys or so, with figs and cakes and, and everything she'd get her hands on, and she rushes out and meets David on the way. It's in First Samuel. Why don't you go to First Samuel? I want you to see this. What happens when you try to settle the score yourself? What happens when you take matters in your own hand? First Samuel, 25th chapter. Let, let's start at verse 23. We'll, we'll look, at, look at verse 22. Here's David's attitude. So and more also do God unto the enemies of David, if I leave of them that pertain to him any, any male any male left by morning. Abigail saw David, she hasted, and lighted off the ass, and fell before David on her face, and bowed herself to the ground, and fell at his feet, and said, Upon me, O Lord, my Lord, upon me let this iniquity be. Look at verse 25. Let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal. For as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, means evil, and folly is with him. But I, thy handmaiden, saw not the young men of my Lord, whom thou didst send. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord liveth, and as, the soul, as thy soul liveth, seeing the Lord hath withholden thee from coming to shed blood, and from avenging thyself with thine own hand, now let thine enemies and they that seek evil to my Lord be as Nabal. Now this blessing which thine handmaiden hath brought unto my Lord, let it be even given to the young men that follow my Lord. I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thine handmaiden, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord fight, lighteth, fighteth the battles of the Lord, and evil hath not been found in thee all the days. But you see, evil is about to be found in this man. David was about to avenge. He's in anger. Yet a man has risen to pursue thee and to seek thy soul. But the soul of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God. And the souls of thy enemies, them shall he sling out as out of the middle of a sling. And it shall come to pass when the Lord shall have done to my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning thee, and shall have appointed thee ruler over Israel, that this shall be no grief unto thee, nor offensive heart unto my Lord, either that thou hast shed blood causeless, or that the Lord hath avenged himself. But when the Lord shall have dealt with thee, with my Lord, then remember thy handmaiden. Look at me, please. This woman, Abigail, preaches a message we all need to hear. And it's very, very clear. All right, somebody's risen up against you. And what she's saying now, be assured, David, that God will deal with your enemies. Now, people, listen to me, please. This word, this word, you cannot read 
through the Psalms. You cannot read through the Proverbs without being absolutely convinced that you cannot slander another brother or sister. You cannot hurt your brother or sister. You cannot offend your brother or sister and, and get away with it. God says, I will repay. Get that and understand. He, if I offend, it doesn't matter who it is, if it's a pastor, whoever it is. We cannot offend our brother. We cannot go on serving God. We cannot go on praising God as if nothing happened. There is a payday. And that's what this woman is saying. David, you must know God's going to deal with this man. God will deal with your enemies. But you will not take it in your own hands. You will not avenge yourself. Lest somewhere down the line where God really begins to bring you into the fullness of your ministry or the direction God wants you to go and use you, you will not have this on your hands. This is blood on your hands. Folks, it's blood on our hands when we try to get even in our own strength. When we try to avenge ourselves and get back at people. At husbands who have abandoned you, wives who have abandoned you, who uh, relatives that hurt you, on the job, wherever it may be, another Christian. God says, look, I'll take care of that, but get your hands off of it. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. That's the whole message. Look at verse 36. And Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he held a feast in his house, like the feast of a king. Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunken. Wherefore she told him nothing less or more until the morning light. It came to pass in the morning when the wine was gone out of Nabal, and his wife had told him these things, that his heart died within him, and he became as a stone. And it came to pass about ten days after that the Lord smote Nabal that he died. And when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord that hath pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal, and hath kept his servant from evil. For the Lord hath returned the wickedness of Nabal upon his own head. Oh, look at me, folks. This, this, this is one of the most important things that you and I can learn as a church, as Christians, that we dare not, under any circumstances, Pray against our enemies. You cannot, you cannot pray against them that God will bring judgment upon them. You can't even think. And if God is beginning to judge them, you have to draw back. You can't rejoice in it. You can't even secretly uh, think this is God's judgment. God's getting even. No, no, no. You, you draw back. You can pray for them, but you don't pray at them. This David could have absolutely withstood the work of God in his ministry and his calling for years. His episode uh, with Bathsheba. This, this could have been the worst blood on his hands of his career because he was in anger trying to get back. I've got to move on here very because I have so much... David in his dying or, or, or in his dying day, his, his last message, David said, It is God that has avenged me. He's looking back. He said, It is God who avenged me. He brought me forth from my enemies. He delivered me from my strong enemy, from them that hated me, for they, they were too strong for me. He delivered me because he delighted in me. Hallelujah. All right, you say, Wait a minute, Pastor. If I can't uh, curse my enemy, and I can't call fire or judgment on him. I can't even think woe upon him. I can't rejoice when he suffers. I can't avenge myself upon him. I can't pray against him. Then how am I going to get even? I'll tell you there's a way to get even. You know how you get even? You kill him. With mercy and kindness. Let me give it to you. Go to Romans 12, please. Romans 12. We're going to start killing some people here. Some hot-blooded killing. God's way. Romans 12. Let's start verse 19. 
or verse 17. Recompense no man evil for evil. Do you hear that? You could do that in the Old Testament. An eye for an eye and two for two, but you can't do it since the cross. Recompense no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as life in you, lie peaceably, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. So you're going to kill him with kindness. And if he thirsts, give him drink. Now here's the fire you call down. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. You say, wait a minute, brother. What, what are, what's this about calling fire down? Uh, fire, coals of fire on the head? Yes, that's exactly. You can't burn them up. But you can bring down the coals of fire on their head. And these are acts of kindness. If he's hungry, you feed him. If he's thirsty, you give him drink. And what that means, hunger and thirst, has to do with any kind of physical, spiritual need that you find out or told that they are enduring. You are to move in and show kindness, acts of kindness and love uh, to, uh, 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 for your enemies. And you say, what's the fire? Well, first of all, that's the fire of conviction. Oh, do you, you start a fire of conviction? Where, see, what is the motive? In fact, not only conviction, but curiosity. And there are some people, when you begin to be kind to your enemy, they'll say, what's the hook? Why is he doing it? Why is she doing it? Ah, uh, they got some secret plan. I know, I know, I know them. Fire. The Bible says, give place to wrath. If you read the context, it's not the wrath. My wrath, don't give place to my wrath. That doesn't mean just lay your wrath down. This is talking about the wrath of God. Give place to the wrath of God. In other words, let God handle. He said, I'm, I'm going to repay. There's going to be wrath. But he said, you lay your hands off right now. You give place to me to let me work. And you go while I'm working, taking care of my part of repaying and recompensing. You spend your time heaping on good. You do good to them. Now let me tell you something. You can't fulfill the last of this chapter till you go to the first verse. The only people that are capable of doing kind deeds and killing their enemies with kindness and mercy are those who have been a living sacrifice on the altar. It's, on, it's verse 1. No human being can do this without having first been consumed on the altar. Present your body, verse 1 says, as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. And what is that? This is a, a person, for example, a Christian who's been wounded and, and hurt and grieved and full of pain and tears and weeping, but goes to the altar and says, Lord, I bring my hurt to you. I bring all of my pain to you. Consume it on the altar. Burn it up. Burn it. Consume it. I don't want anything left. Beloved, I want nothing to do with the new rage in the church. The new rage now is to go back to your childhood. Go back to some ancestral curse. And, and try to find out where you were wounded. Listen to me, please. Paul said, forgetting those things that are behind, I press on to the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And if you've been to the altar as a living sacrifice, those memories are burnt. You don't go back and dig them out. You leave them under the blood. You leave them in ashes at the altar. Even Freud himself said, and listen closely, Freud, the psychiatrist, said, trying to associate past hurts with present problems is like solving the hunger problem by passing up menus. All it is is a menu to a hungry person. That's even being discounted now by psychology. And yet we've got Christians running around sitting there, well my my father abused me, my 
grandfather abused me, I've been hurt. Everybody's been hurt. Everybody's been wounded. Why are you digging in that garbage pail? Get out of it! In Jesus' name, get out of it! All it does is increase your bitterness. You go to verse 1 here. It, it, it says you present your body as a living sacrifice, and then you're no longer conformed. You're transformed in your mind by the renewing of your mind. Your new mind is not digging up the trash. You've got a new mind. You have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ holds no grudges, not against the past. You'll forgive your father, your mother, your grandfather. I don't care who. We've got people here from Haiti. How do you go back to your ancestors when they've had voodoo for 20 years? You're telling me the blood of Jesus Christ has no power. He has power now. I don't care how many grandparents and great-grandparents were voodoo and priest. You're under the blood of Jesus. Stand and believe it in the name of Christ. Bible says when you go to the altar you've been transformed the Bible said you honor in honor you prefer one another in verse 12 it says you become patient in your tribulation and then too you continue in prayer you bless them that persecute you in verse 14 you never curse others it says and you pay back no man evil for evil in verse 17 and as much as possible you live at peace with all men as much as possible there are times you cannot I've known wives who've had to put husbands out because they were being beaten or because of drugs and other things. That's what the Bible says. There's times you cannot. It's impossible. There are situations, and the Lord's understanding that, and the Lord will not have you have a guilt trip on you for having to do that. But listen to me. There is only one way, one scriptural way, and one way only that you deal with your enemies, how you get even. You kill them with kindness. And the fire that comes down upon their head is the consuming fire that has burned up all my ego. It's burned up everything. I have I have nothing left, but when I come to you, I have a fire of forgiveness, a fire of love, and hold nothing against you. That's that's called uncompromising, unrestricted love. Hallelujah. Now think about your enemy before we close now. Think about that one person that's hurt you and wounded you, caused you so much pain or more. You know, you can't stop rumors. I, I, I picked up a notice yesterday in my office, or Friday, a book's been written. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm referred to in the book as having been a recovered alcoholic. I've never had a drink in my life. But, and, and, and I said, Lord, what I do? I didn't have to do anything because friends all over the country heard about it. I mean, they just bombarded his telephone and he called his publisher and they removed it and started another edition. How do you fight it? You can't. You want to get on the phone and blister? Say, Poo. There, there, There's another man has got a big mailing list, and he, he sent out a, a story that Billy Graham and so many others, including me, that, that I, I had ghostwriters writing all my books, writing my books. And I called him. And I, I said, I just want to tell you that, that that's not true, but I'm not threatening you. I'm not, going, I'm not talking about a lawyer. I'm not talking about anything. I just want to explain it to you. Then you can do with it what you please. And I was very gentle. The Lord had put kindness in my heart. He said, you're the first one that's called me and not tried to threaten me and sue me and everything else. And I said, well, there's nothing I can do. And he said, well, I'll retract it. I'll retract it. Sometimes you just very gently you talk to the person, go to that person's hurt you, and talk quietly, talk lovingly, but don't go to them. Bless God, you hurt me, and I'm going to tell you, 
my Bible says, if my brother offends you, i got to go to him, so I'm coming to you! <laughs> that husband left you? You going to get on the phone and start chewing him out? Or do you pray for him? You pray for him. Because you find out when, when the judgment comes, you'll be so glad you prayed. Be so glad you had nothing in your heart. Then you have no regrets. Hallelujah. Amen. By the way, in the house of God, very clearly the scripture says, Woe to him that offends. Woe. Better, a millstone hung around his neck, concrete in his feet and dumped in the East River. That's right. It doesn't say East River, but it says better he was drowned than to offend the little one. That, that means any little Christian, any one who's walking in faith, God help that one who offends. And so I, I told you, with this I close. A uh, number, good number of months ago, I went through a very difficult time with tremendous slander and uh, I didn't even want to get up in the mornings for a while. It was a very, very difficult time. I just held the arms of Jesus. You know what helped me? I said, Lord, I don't fear man. I don't care what anybody in the world says anymore. As long as I know you love me. As long as I know you're pleased with me. And folks, when you know that the blood has been applied to your heart. But in that time, the Lord named, I think it was 14 people that I had to call. He made a whole list. Their faces came. I had to call them and repent. Things I'd said and done. And the Lord said, if, if you're going to do this right, you've got to look at yourself, not just at your enemies, but look at yourself who you may have hurt. That's what I'd like you to do now in the name of the Holy, in, in, the, in the light of the Holy Spirit, as you sit here, Lord, is there someone that I need to call, somebody I need to make things right with? Is there somebody who believes that I'm their enemy? I'm their enemy. I called somebody on Thursday and said that very thing. I want to know how I offended you that you had to react like you did against me. I've got to know. And see, if you do that in the love of Christ, you are free and all the joy that's going to come to your heart. Will you stand? This won't make you shop, but it'll heal you. It'll take the poison out of you. Hallelujah. You know, the saddest thing of all with this, uh, I'm going to give it an invitation. Look at me up in the balcony of the main floor and even those standing here and down in the lower rotunda, wherever you may be hearing me. Very important you listen to this. What about your grudge against the Lord? And some of you stand here in the service this morning. You can't understand why you, you have had to go through what you've had to go through and why it goes on and on and doesn't seem to stop. And I'm speaking in the Holy Spirit right now. God brought you here this morning. You're here for a reason. God's ministering to you now, trying to set you free. Don't walk out still enclosed in that prison that has imprisoned you in the last while. The Lord wants to break those chains. He wants to open up the prison doors and let you go free this morning. God is not angry at you. He's not mad at you. But he will not, he will not have you continue because he knows what it does to you. not have you continue with this secret thing in your heart that, that says, God, when you say, why, God, it's, it's, God, you're not faithful, you've forgotten me, you're not acting in my behalf. The Lord knows exactly where you live. He knows exactly what you're going through. He's not forgotten you. 
ask God to take that out of your heart. If it's in your heart, those questions and, and that, that little something that keeps you from the close relationship with the Lord, keeps you from intimacy because there, there's just something there. It's there. You don't voice it, but it's there deep, deep down inside. Oh, God. <laughs> you, and you, you just don't feel like pressing into the Lord. You don't feel like worshiping and you don't feel like giving yourself anymore because just a little peeve that God, He's not working, He's not answering prayers, not doing what you feel it should have been done by now. Heavenly Father, I pray you give us a wonderful Holy Ghost conviction, the kind of conviction, Lord, that draws us, that will not drive us away, Lord, but draws us to you, to a place of repentance and love. Lord, there are many people standing here right now been wounded, they, they've been carrying hurts. They've been looking back instead of up. And I pray, Lord, that you forgive us today and that you turn our hearts around and bring us toward you. All our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. We're going to sing an invitational number. And if you're here this morning, I'm, I'm waiting for the words of the Holy Spirit to come. If you're here this morning, You've had something against somebody, or there's been bitterness, or, 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 or you have been blaming something in your past. I want you to get out of your seat and come down here and make a total repentance of heart and say, God, from this day on, you're helping me by the Holy Spirit. I will never again look back. I will never again accuse anything of my past. And Lord... I want this out of my spirit, out of my heart. Bring that wound, bring that hurt to Jesus. Up in the balcony, go to the stairs on either side. Downstairs, lower rotunda, just come up the stairs and down any aisle and meet us here at the front, wherever you may be. Just come and meet us here. I was reading about the great D.L. Moody, the great evangelist, years ago preaching at the Chicago Fair. And he, he had thousands and he preached. He didn't, he decided not to give an altar call. He said, I want you to think about this in the next Friday night when we come back again here. We, we, we want you to be ready to make a decision. And he regretted that the rest of his life because that very night the Chicago fire broke out and hundreds died in that Holocaust. And he says, oh God, I didn't give that altar call. How many of them went into eternity? And this is life and death with us. And to, right now, you say, well, I, I'm not on drugs, I'm not on alcohol. But you see, if you carry a grudge, it can damn you just as quick as anything else. It, it can destroy you. It can destroy your hope, your faith, and it can hurt your physical and spiritual life. And the Lord wants you to live free. He wants, you to be, he wants us to be free people. If you have anything in your heart, I want everybody that came forward now just to look up to Jesus right now. Just close your eyes and look out of yourself. That doesn't mean he's out there. He's right here. But just, just look out of yourself. And I want you to pray this prayer with me because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And if this can be truly your prayer, now I may be having you repeat what I say, but if it becomes your prayer... And if you can't pray it from your heart, don't pray it. But if you can pray it from your heart, you hear what I say, and you pray it, it becomes yours. And the Lord hears you. He answers. I want you to pray this with me. Jesus, I want you to forgive me for every grudge and every bit of bitterness that I've harbored in my heart. Forgive me and pluck it out. Lord Jesus, Forgive me also for my feelings and my hurt toward you. I repent and I am sorry. Jesus, put a love in my heart for everyone who's hurt me. And help me, oh God, by your Holy Spirit to give up my past and all who have hurt me and not to dwell upon it but to look to Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith. Keep me, Lord, by focusing on you. Now let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, those who stand before me have asked forgiveness for sins and grudges and bitterness 
And all of these things, Lord, how faithful and merciful you are to go deep into every heart right now. We don't have to scream at you. We don't have to jump at you. We don't have to beg and plead. Lord Jesus, you're here right now. Holy Spirit, bring healing power right now. Flow through this crowd. Flow through these who come to you humbly and broken and say, Lord, I'm sorry, I want to be healed. Take it out of my heart. Give me a loving, forgiving spirit so that I'll know that I have the right spirit. And Jesus will never have to say, you don't know what spirit you're of. Be able to say, I have his spirit because I have mercy. I have love in my heart. Will you, by an act of grace right now, forgive that person? Forgive those people on the job, relatives, husband, wife, dad, mother in the past. Will you absolutely forgive right now? Just say, Lord, I forgive. I forgive. Help me to forget it now. Help me to lay it down. Lord, I come to your altar now as a living sacrifice. Lord, consume all my ego, my pride, my hurt. Consume it. Burn it up, Lord. Take it away. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we give you thanks. This is the conclusion of the message.